Retro Season 3, Episode 20. I don't even know what keeping track of the season and the episodes means, but we do it. And welcome to a new episode. I'm your host, Brandon Davis, joined today by Aaron Perrine. What's going on, y'all? Big, big, big show today. That's right. It, the, you want you a chunky episode you're getting it today. We got Jenna Anderson. Hey, everybody. This will be especially chunky. I'm so excited. This is, yeah, that's right. That's right. This episode's been eating good. And Jamie Girac is here. Good morning, junk, junk, junk. Let's go. <laughs> right, that's right. We are all very excited because the high evolutionary himself, Chakudi Awuji, is joining us in the second half of today's show. The reason we're doing it in the second half is because we are going to have some spoilers for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Uh, everything's fair game. So if you haven't seen Guardians 3 yet, we wanted you to be able to stay through the first half of the show uh, and continue through the second half and hear from Chakudi, Mr. High Evolutionary, in the second half of the show. It's going to be awesome. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to note at the top of the show. One is that Chakudi Awuji is joining us. Uh, another is that if you are a Spider-Verse fan, uh, we're putting together a special Phase Zero episode where we're going to have trivia with some really, really, really cool prizes. I will not spoil what the surprises are. But y'all see the kind of stuff I like to collect. Y'all see the kind of that. So we got some cool stuff. So uh, if you want to be a part of this Spider-Verse trivia, where you have to be available this Sunday. We're going to record it and do this whole thing on Sunday. Uh, send an email to phase0 at comicbook.com. Make the subject Spider-Verse event. Tell us why you are the perfect fan to be a part of our Spider-Verse trivia show. Uh, and that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, if you're listening to this in podcast form and it's like already Friday, I'm sorry. I'm pretty much going to have to line everybody up by Wednesday and Thursday. But I appreciate you listening. And hopefully we'll get you in on the next one. Uh, I think we're going to find some awesome Spider-Verse fans to celebrate uh, the release of Across the Spider-Verse. Miles Morales, Gwen Stacy fans, come on. Come on, come on. And uh, also, if you're in the Nashville area or you want to be for a weekend, uh, if you come out, there's an event called uh, ICCCon Nashville. I don't know what that stands for. I probably should. But uh, I also, you know, whatever, I'm just, I'm hosting some really dope stuff there. If you look at the guest list, it's not going to be hard to put together what I'm going to be hosting. It's not like officially announced yet, but I'll just say that. So if you're in the area, May 27th, I believe, 28th, maybe that weekend, uh, come hang out uh, at this Comic-Con uh, just outside of Nashville. And uh, it will be the convention without fear is all I'll say to tease that. Uh, and we have some news to run through uh, in the first half of today's show. So we're going to get to that. And then in the second half of today's show, the High Evolutionary is joining us. But Jamie, I'm going to let you kick us off with the news today because I have already been rambling. Oh, my God. The first bit of news. Loki season two finally has a release date. We've been waiting so long for this. October 6th, it's starting. Uh, this is uh, kind of later than we expected. We thought it would probably, we originally thought summer because that's when the first season came out. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions. Why is this, why is this happening? Did, is it because Secret Invasion is first? Is this Jonathan Majors related? Uh, what do you guys think about this date? Way later than I thought it would be. I'm going to be honest. And I, I, I do wonder if it is like a Jonathan Majors thing, like they're trying to figure out that situation before dropping this. But I don't know. Maybe it's completely not that. I have no idea. But it is October 6th is. I definitely thought this would be like a August at the latest type show. Am I alone in that? No, I, I completely agree. I, I am very curious about the majors of it all. I do think that that might end up playing a role in some sort of way. Apparently at the like upfront event yesterday that they announced this at, they like screened a trailer that didn't really mention Kang or acknowledge him very much. Apparently like Quantumania's description on Disney Plus doesn't even really reference him either. So it might just be that. It might just be, I don't know, to get the VFX ready. Who knows? Either way, I'm glad that we're getting it, but it is definitely later than I would have expected. Whoa, the Quantum Mania description on Disney Plus doesn't mention Kang. From what I've heard, I haven't checked, but I saw that on Twitter this morning. So I'm I don't pulling know. it up right now. Let's 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 take a look at this. Superhero partners Scott Lang and Hope Van Dyne return to continue their adventures as Ant Man and the Wasp together. Together with Hope's parents Hank and Hank Pym and Janet Van Dyne and Scott's daughter Cassie, the family finds themselves exploring the quantum realm, interacting with strange new creatures, and embarking on an adventure that will push them beyond the limits of what they thought was possible. No mention at all of Kang. That wow. is interesting. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. I mean, we also don't know how big of a role Kang has in Loki season two. We just know that there was a credit scene. So still, I mean, I don't know. I imagine Loki or Kang did have a, or does have a pretty big role in that show, but I, who knows? Maybe we're blowing that up and there's a different villain in Loki season two. Hmm. I can tell you one thing. They ain't reshooting nothing. They ain't reshooting a darn thing. It's going to come out the way it was. So uh, I don't know if we're going to get new developments between now and October. And boy, how is that a long time to have developments? But it's in the can. Like, it's already ready to roll, which is related to what we're going to talk about next. Some of this stuff is already done. 
rider strike or not, it's over. It's done, you know. Okay. So we'll see what happens. That is a long break. How many months is that between uh, Secret Invasion and Loki? I mean, Secret Invasion, six episodes, June 21st. So let's say end of July, probably it's over. Yeah. That, you know, another three months. I mean, they could throw a what if in there. They could, who knows, but I don't, it doesn't seem like they're doing that. So yeah, seems like we're gonna have another three months. Yeah, man. man. We're gonna be we're gonna be sitting here doing a <laughs> lot of uh tap dancing for the next yeah. three months, everybody. We're gonna be talking to a lot of people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Speaking of, of Echo. Well, so also, yeah, also on the deck for uh, later this fall, um, Echo Season 1 will be released on November 29th, and it will be all episodes at once. Um, they announced this alongside the Loki reveal. I, I I have so many thoughts about this. It's all entirely positive. I feel a little bad that Echo is the show that is the first one that gets this. As I tweeted, maybe it better the story. Maybe it makes it better so we're not spending each week asking where Fisk and Matt Murdock are. But it feels really weird that this is the first that they're doing this for. Um, this also kind of like similarly to me, like, oh, we might be getting born again a little bit sooner than we might have otherwise because they're probably trying to get this out ahead of time. But what do you guys think about this? I know Aaron has a lot of thoughts. I actually had a, I had two thoughts. One was what you one was one that you just said, which was I remember She Hulk got criticized for advertising daredevil and then he didn't come until episode eight of nine and that i think that's a fair criticism to for, of any show i think that if you advertise a character people really really like and then you save them until you know the very end it a ruins the surprise but b also keeps people watching for something that they were promised and didn't get until the end which i i understand that kind of frustration and i don't want to see echo go through that but also i was thinking maybe because this is probably going to attract a daredevil kingpin like that netflix audience a bit uh, maybe it's just like, okay, well, they got to binge it. Those That audience likes to binge stuff, so we'll see if we could treat them to this. I don't know. Personally, I actually think it's a it's a sign that the show wouldn't catch on without in, in a weekly format. That's what I think it means, but I'm trying to be optimistic and see like other reasons why they could have, positive reasons why they could have just decided to put it all out at once. Should Damn. I go? For, I feel like Aaron is so much that I'll go Go first. I'll tell you what, it gives me the ick a little bit. I, I yeah. it doesn't sit right with me. It does not yeah. sit right with me. Uh, it means, I think it either means that they don't have faith in the show, um, or if it is about uh, the, they think people are going to be impatient, they've never cared about them before. I don't know what to show uh, about a woman of color with a disability, and it's the first one on their roster that they're like, whop, here it goes. And and I don't know, all the Disney Plus shows that do, that do this don't seem to get any traction. I I mean, I've been trying to push them up. It's mayhem, but that was all dumped at once. And I haven't heard anybody else really talking about that show. So uh, maybe, maybe there's a good reason. Maybe it's going to be an amazing binge. You know me, I binge everything after it ends anyway. Um, and I'm going to watch it and I'm excited about this show, but it doesn't sit right with me. I will also say on the binging argument, like I've seen people be like, well, what's wrong with the binge model? I'm not saying that there's not value to it, but I think dropping this on a Wednesday, people are not going to have six hours of their time on a Wednesday to be able to binge the show and avoid spoilers and be able to be part of the conversation. And so that kind of bums me out a little bit too, because I feel like the conversation around the show is going to be so siphoned off just by people who either saw screeners ahead of time or are able to do that binge immediately on Wednesday. So that just kind of depressed me a little bit um i i want to say at the beginning i i am mad impatient so i i love getting all my episodes at once but i do think that it hurts the discussion around the show and the ability to build an audience for a show because all of it's just out there all at once and having it be this particular project is kind of weird not gonna lie it's a little ominous a little strange also uh those of us who are looking forward to maybe some of the things that maybe quote unquote a majority audience isn't as excited about, like they're, they're not going to release all 20 gajillion episodes Daredevil board again all on the same day. Um, you know, we have to feel a little, little strange about that. But I've heard at least through the grapevine that the show is strong too. It's not like this isn't uh David Zaslav, this isn't this isn't releasable, like sort of weird thing going on. So I don't. I don't know. It made me feel weird. It's been a it's been a week of weird decisions over yes. at the old house of ideas. It's been a it's been a weird a weird couple of days for sure over there. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that 
common reaction and the one I'm having is that it shows a lack of confidence in the show. That's kind of the signal it sends to me. Now, I could be way off because this is also the first time we've seen this for a Marvel or Star Wars show, like one of the big franchises. But like you guys have said, all the stuff that gets put out in its entirety, it comes and goes. And like, I imagine if WandaVision had been a, a, a one-time release, A, it would have been unfinished because they were still working on the finale while episode one was available. But like, imagine if they waited two months and just dropped them all. Imagine not having that conversation every week. The show wouldn't have blown up to what it was. It never would have. It just wouldn't have. And obviously, WandaVision is, is, is kind of an exception. Like, it's kind of the phenomenon of this conversation. Like, I don't, I, I just think it was made really perfectly for that weekly model. So it really lent itself to discussion. Not every show needs to be that. It's not going to have that conversation because it's not as mystery driven as WandaVision was. But uh, yeah, this, I don't know the, the, the all at once, maybe, maybe also it could be because they have another show coming. They have something else coming in December or January that they don't want to have it interfere with. Maybe a star Wars show is going to be dropping and they don't want to have a miss Marvel uh, Obi-Wan situation. So they're like, you know what? We got too much programming get it out there but still it feels weird that it does just kind of well you guys are just kind of dumping it out there we'll, we'll, but we'll see we'll see hopefully echo is awesome we'll all be watching so uh, all right captain america new world order got a new cast member in the form of uh whoa, 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 whoa. nobody nobody gets that except me huh that's just me where's the conductor where's the conductor oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you to every the, the two people in the comment section who get that. Uh, Seth Rollins has been cast in Captain America New World Order. Uh, and this is interesting because he's married to Becky Lynch. And Becky Lynch was cut out of a scene from Eternals that she filmed. So WWE superstars making their way to the MCU. I'm a big fan of Seth Rollins. I think Seth Rollins is one of the most talented professional wrestlers. Not a huge fan of his character and the gimmicky laugh and that kind of part of Seth Rollins, but I do think he is a hell of a performer. And I think he's one of the most talented actual wrestlers in the WWE. So I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, I've just been following Seth for years now, and I think he's doing a great job in wrestling. I think it's super fun to see him. Uh, and if you guys, WrestleMania 39 did a promo. Uh, it was 39 this year, right, Aaron? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. He did the WrestleMania Goes Hollywood thing, mm -hmm. and he did a promo where he was Joker going down the stairs just like Joaquin Phoenix. So the man's been trying to crack into the, the comic book world forever. And I mean, who's he playing? It seems like a Serpent Society character, but I'm imagining Jenna, Jenna has some theories. Jenna. Here, maybe. I, I have no theories because every time I've tried to guess who like a wrestler is playing, I've usually been wrong. This also just feels like when Lake Bell was in Wakanda forever and we speculated so much about who she was going to play. And it was just like random scientist number three. So I, I would love for him to play a comic character, but I could also see him just being like a random Serpent Society like underling. I don't know. Either way, it's cool that he's in here. I still just don't follow wrestling, but I'm happy. I know he's a huge like nerd and a huge superhero fan. So it's cool that he's in here. The comic book <laughs> slack thinks that he's like Cobra from how his like costume mm. looks or whatever. And I'm like, well, I mean, Batroc the Leaper, you'll come back. Hopefully you'll come <laughs> back, buddy. No, I okay. actually thought about that. I was like, George St. Pierre, that man was in Captain America, the Winter Soldier for like all of 22 seconds with Steve Rott, with Chris Evans, stuntman uh, opposite him. But he got to come back. He got that full circle, that, that beefed up Macklemore love a man. Uh, mm -hmm. And also... Uh, Danny Ramirez was in the same um, or the same set of set photos, uh, and that man is wearing Joaquin Torres's Falcon suit in Captain Yay. America: New World Order. This is one of those things that, like, if they wanted it to be a secret, they wouldn't have gone and filmed outside. So I don't feel bad talking about it. Like, they know they put these people in costumes outdoors. We're all going to see it. We're all going to talk about it. It's going to circulate. We're not going to use the image because that would probably be illegal. But we will talk about <laughs> it. <laughs> We will embed the tweet if we have to. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's embedded. It ain't ours. Uh, so, yeah, and I, I've been following Danny Ramirez. I think Danny's a great dude. And uh, I know he's excited to be a part of that film. So I think it's cool because if you remember, he got the wings and Falcon and Winter Soldier from, from uh, Sam Wilson's old Falcon suit. So it just makes sense that he's following that comic book counterpart. Jenna, that's got to excite you a little bit. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Anytime we get like a comic accurate costume with any of the weird like color schemes and whatever that that entails, I'm always happy. So I he deserves to be able to fully be a superhero. So this is exciting. I'm with it. I'm with it. All right, we got a couple more things we got to touch on here before High Evolutionary Chikuti Uji joins the show. Um, so we got other extended uh, MCU news, I suppose, if you consider it that way. Uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor uh, cast in Venom 3. We don't know who he's playing. We can all, all set a prayer circle that he's Mordo. 
Um, and that that kind of gets resolved for those of you who care about uh, him actually getting to do something other than just being like, er, you're annoying Benedict Cumberbatch. Um, the cast for Venom 3 is looking a little stacked. It's looking a little like, like wow, they got a lot of talent going on over here. Anybody have any thoughts? So, they keep, it's like, they keep pulling us in with these names. <laughs> <laughs> like, That's I, the thing. I, I'm like, it's like, stop doing this to me. Stop getting me excited about this stuff. <laughs> Oh, Jenna, I will say when, when when Jim Viscardi popped out of his jail cell to go in the comic book Slack yesterday and be like, "Is he playing Mordo?" I was just like, it would be the funniest thing ever if Mordo's story just culminated in in the Venom verse as opposed to being wrapped up in the MCU at all. Like that would be very funny. I I'm just gonna throw a shot in the dark because why not? What if he's playing Null? Like you could just have him be the god of the symbiotes, just big cosmic symbiote stuff that would be amazing if that ended up happening but i feel like whatever he's going to be cast as is going to be something campy and ridiculous and i'm excited to see him play it i would love only if it. christian bale comes back yeah Ooh. um he, he he talked to him again brandon maybe he will um <laughs> <laughs> i hope he's like 838 mordo and he's like you stop spider-man and the weird this weird scooby-doo gang please help me tom, I, tom hardy huh i can't with these venom movies man i'm not gonna lie to you <laughs> I'm not lie to you, man. Venom one, maybe a little bit of a pass. <laughs> Venom two, I just think is just it's just not a good film, man. It just looks like it looks like they fired the editors halfway through and hired a new team that barely watched the footage. Like it just, I think Let There Be Carnage is just a messy movie, man. And I always like, but I, I, now that I've had time to sit on it and watch it, unfortunately, watch it again. I just, I don't think these Venom movies are, are good. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I love Venom, the character. I think Tom Hardy as Eddie Brock and Venom. I am very entertained by that. At minimum, I'm very entertained by his commitment to the part. Other than that, my goodness gracious, I hope Venom 3 is good because I'm going to watch it. But these first two, I'm just going to say they're no Guardians of the Galaxy. They're no Guardians of the Galaxy 1 and 2. Brandon. Not even Iron Man 1 and 2. Wow. Iron Man Whoa. 2 is movie. Elon Musk is Iron Man too. <laughs> uh, yeah, anybody else got anything on the Venom 3 front they want to talk about? I hope the movie's good. I really do. I saw that Craven trailer and I was like, this man just spit a nose at the camera. We might be doing something here, Sony. We're probably not, but we might be. Hopefully, fingers crossed. They got Spider-Verse right. They could do it. They could do it. We'll see. We'll see. Anybody else got anything on the Chuatel LG4 Venom 3 front before we move on a little bit? Mm -mm. Yeah, hard to believe nobody has anything to say about Venom 3. Guardians uh, <laughs> of the Galaxy Volume 3 continues to be a dub at the box office. Honestly, best best, best Marvel movie in a minute. Um, and it's showing because it made $62.7 million in its second weekend. It has flown past $500 million at the global box office. That is already more than the movie we talked about a few moments ago, Ant-Man and the Wasp's Quantumania's entire run. Guardians in like less in like nine days made what Ant Man made in however long a movie is in theaters for. Uh, it, this week one to week two drop is a forty seven percent week one to week two dip. It is the second best MCU film holdover from week one to week two out of what is this through film number three hundred and nine now. Uh, I actually have lost track. What is this like film number thirty? Some it's actually in the thirties now. Like that. It's well because I don't know the Infinity Saga had twenty three. So we're at like probably 31, 32. I'm sure someone in the comments knows what number. I know it's 41 for. with the shows. Yeah. Uh, so, but, but if you take out the shows, I don't know the number. Right. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. So Guardians Volume 3 is doing very well. And I think that that's a product of just being an outright good movie and a fantastic end to this trilogy and having characters. It's a combination of everything going right for this one. It didn't beat Volume 2's opening weekend box office, which we've already talked about at length on a previous episode. Go listen to that. But I think this showing that this, this drop is not... It's, it's a really good holdover is a testament to how good the movie is, how much people are enjoying it and how many good things people are saying, which is encouraging people to go out and see it. And also people seeing it again. This is honestly the first Marvel movie in probably over a year that I've wanted to see more than once. I mean, I've seen them all more than once, but I, this is the first one I really wanted to go back and experience again. And I liked it even more the second time. Uh, is that, what do you guys think of this, these numbers? I still, to the point that I made last week of like, it's not like a fourth movie hinges on this box office numbers. Like either way, I knew the numbers were going to be good. It is shocking that it already has more than all of Quantumania. But I think that this 
adds an interesting wrinkle to the whole superhero fatigue argument because it goes to what James Gunn himself has been saying of like people are just sick of empty spectacle like people want to just have an entertaining good like solid movie and volume three is that and so the fact that the numbers are translating to that I am so happy. It'll be interesting to see once we have like Fast X and Little Mermaid and the entire rest of the summer, how much money it ultimately ends up making. But I think that this is a really strong start. Definitely. Um, I'm going to be interesting to see, interested to see how it does this weekend up against Fast X. Like, how is it, how is it going to do now? Um, Cause it's not going to win this weekend. Uh, there's no way. Um, <laughs> no. So I'm, I'm but I'm inter- but I feel like it's still going to make some money and I'm really interested to, to see that. But, Oh, uh, but I'll tell you one thing. I'm not surprised. It's already made more than Quantumania because <laughs> one's a good movie and one's a bad movie. <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. I just think Guardians volume three, the more I think about it, I, the more I like it every time I have a thought about that movie. I think it's just so damn good. And I'm so glad to see uh, that Aaron's top pick of the year. It has delivered. It helps when the <laughs> script of the movie doesn't leak two weeks before the movie comes out. I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, I always tell you, there's other stuff that goes into stuff being weird. I'm like, uh, did not help. Did not help. Uh Ended that Reddit. God bless them for ended that, ended that Reddit, which I feel like uh, we might need to call it again as we keep getting these Captain America 4 uh, things keep getting whispered about and seen <laughs> out in public. And I get texts from family members who do not watch this show. I, I don't hold it against y'all, but y'all should watch the show about what's going on in these these images. So it's good that it's doing good. It's good that theaters are back. Go watch my girl how, how, sing the doors off the theater. Go watch Vin Diesel turn Fast X into five movies. And please go watch Polite Society on VOD this weekend because it's worth your time, too. So it's just good. It's a good thing. I say this. I I think Super Mario Brothers might be the only billion dollar movie of the year. It will. I I think that's true. I I don't know what else. What else could do it? Because I don't think Guardians is going to hit a billion. Maybe Mission Impossible somehow? I was going to say, Mission might get close, but I don't know if it'll fully hit All because of me. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to give it a billion dollars. Just my like <laughs> <laughs> Jamie's going to have the Guinness World Record for most times you've seen it in a row. Like 12 <laughs> times, back and back and forth. All right, y'all. Uh, yeah, well we'll, we'll 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 keep track of the box office throughout the year. We'll keep updating you guys on the Guardians box office each week because it's fun to talk about. We're going to take a quick one-minute break. Our man just checked in. Uh, Chikuri Awuji is in our virtual backstage. So we're going to take a quick maybe minute and a half break here. We'll come right back, uh, and that's when our interview with the High Evolutionary starts. Hide your pets. Run, run, run. No, I'm just kidding. He's a, he's a super cool dude. We've, I've interviewed Chakudi a few times, and he is just the coolest, and I'm excited for everybody to get to know him on the show. So we'll be back in a moment with the High Evolutionary. See you in just a minute. Welcome back to Phase Zero, Season 3, Episode 20. Without further ado, it is time. It is the reason you all came today. We have the High Evolutionary himself. You may also know him from a DC property we might touch on on today's show. Chakuri Awuji is on Phase Zero. How are you, man? Thank you for joining us. I'm very well. Good to see you again, mate. You know, always a pleasure. It's great to see you. Well, I actually did. I just want to start hearing what it's been like these past few weeks because the Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 
has got an incredible reception. I've seen it. We've all seen it more than once. It's doing well at the box office, which we were just talking about earlier on the show. Uh, and fans are loving it. Fans are loving your work and also, as you intended, having a hard time with your character. So uh, what, is this, what has the past couple weeks been like for you? Oh man, I I've struggled to wrap my head around it. It's it's it's. I mean, as you know, we've talked before. It was similar in in, in peacemaking, but this is another level to it of uh, trying to figure out: is that really me on that stage? Is that really me? That's the subject of this conversation, um, and and that's how I feel. It's still slightly surreal, but I'm very excited about it. I'm now catching up with sleep. It was a crazy press tour and madness. I'm finally catching up with sleep and and feeling myself again. But I'm just really happy, and a big part of my happiness is the is is how it's affecting people around me, how overjoyed and happy about the whole thing they are, from my family to my team to my really good friends and stuff. And that's what's making me actually believe it is real, because in my head, it's happening to someone else, you know? <laughs> it's happening to you, man. You deserve it. <laughs> Thank you. Con congratulations, Chuck. Um, so in a recent interview with Variety, you described getting like the call about High Evolutionary mm -hmm. and you made a, a made a joke that I found to be very, very funny. I would like to talk about it for a second. You said, James, is this when you tell me you actually meant to hire uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor instead of me? And yeah. he's like, no, I want you to be the villain of Guardians <laughs> of the Galaxy Volume 3. So what does it feel like to be up there? Do you guys have like a, did, did you send him a text like, ah, I'm up there because you know he just got cast in Venom 3. <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, you know what's hilarious about this is I actually don't know Chewie. I, Chewie and I have met once uh, in Sundance, you know, sort of okay. a director's workshop. I'm not actually Chewie and I, we don't have each other's text messages. I wish I did, you know, but he's, uh, it, it was just because I've always thought he's an exceptional actor. I mean, I remember being in school and seeing him in Amistad and just thinking, who is this guy, you know, and he has such gravitas and ease on the screen. So I'm a big fan of his and our names were both Evo names from Nigeria. So it was an easy joke to make going, you've just, you've just picked the wrong Evo guy, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. But no, he's gonna be great in Venom. I mean, such a class act, you know. Mm -hmm. So the world has finally met the high evolutionary. It's really exciting. You can finally talk a little bit more about the role. So for a little bit of a, a deep dive into this character, what would you say are his biggest strengths and weaknesses? Ooh, his biggest strengths are his weaknesses. Incredible Ooh. intellect. He has incredible, I mean, his, his brain, oh, I, with the exception of Rocket, his brain is like the most incredible <laughs> brain out there. Um, his other strength is, is he has a single mindedness, a real drive, but those are his weaknesses, his single mindedness, his drive, his narcissism, his ego, the, the very things that have made him the evolutionary are the very things that will bring him down. And in that sense, that's why I always refer to him as a sort of Shakespearean character is that the tragic flaw is the very things that give you your strength are the very things that are going to bring you down. And um, so, yeah. That's awesome. So High Evolutionary's comic tenure um, obviously has ties to so many other Marvel's heroes and villains. Uh, did you turn to any of that in the research process and just be like, oh, man, I'm responsible for creating all of these other characters? Um, no, you know, that not so much research for playing the role, more like just like enjoyment for me when I found that I got the role. I'm like, wait, I did this to Thor. Oh, I kicked I kicked the Hulk's ass. You know what I mean? I like. All this stuff was just, I was like, oh, this is the guy I'm taking. So that was more fun for me and excitement. But as far as research went, no, I really believe it was in the tech. As you know, you're, you're probably all James Gunn fans. And you know, James doesn't let a good comic book story get in the way of a James Gunn story. So he creates his own um, <laughs> um, world. And there was plenty on that page with this guy and uh, for me to sink my teeth into now you mentioned you mentioned those those interactions with like Hulk and Thor in comics. It, your version of the character that you got to you got to kind of exist in the mind space of who do you think like he might take interest in a character like Steve Rogers who's got the super soldier serum? Do you think he'd mm -hmm. want to encounter a god like Thor? How do you think he would get along with some of like the MCU characters that we might never probably get to see you interact with as high evolutionary? Yeah, I mean, that would have been, that would be really juicy. I mean, he's always interested in, in um, there was a scene that didn't make it in, the, a line that didn't make it into the final cut of the movie. I think I'm okay to say it because you've seen the movie, but where, I, you know, that scene where, I, you know, sort of knock Groot and Peter Quill down and I'm walking away and then they start doing their great thing with the guns. There's a line that didn't make it where I go, uh, kill the human, bring me the tree. 
Do you know what I mean? So like I was very, I'm always interested in the other. I'm always interested in something I can learn from. So I think the idea of a super soldier and the serums and strength and, and you know, these sort of like um, variants to humanity would have completely fascinated me. I'd have, I'd have definitely gone after them, but to study, not to destroy. Well, destroy, maybe I'd destroy <laughs> the process. <laughs> but, you know, hey, it's all, it's all for the greater good, right? You know, so. So he says, so he so says, he says uh, yeah. I always find it really interesting when we hear about like the stuff that doesn't make the cut and for, you know, for whatever reason, whether it's because the movie was too long or the director just doesn't, it didn't fit in the scene the way it did on the page or something like that. I love to hear because we didn't really spend too much time. Like we saw uh, high evolutionaries backstory with rocket and young rockets, which I guess was, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago, however mm -hmm. long rocket's been you know growing up uh but did you or you with james kind of sit down and think about you know what is high evolutionary's backstory he's not a human like he was in comics he's from an alien race his, mm -hmm. his name isn't herbert which james said on twitter uh mm -hmm. so how much like high evolutionary backstory do you have to kind of put together yourself do you does james kind of fill you in on and consider filming or just gets filmed and doesn't make the cut uh, like do you, like where was he during the thanos blip is that like do you have those conversations or are they all in your head to help flesh it out or does that not even kind of happen I, I don't have I, I don't have this conversation. I didn't even have those conversations with James for Peacemaker. Um, I think because again, I come back to his scripts. I had so much in the scripts and enough there. I mean, the, the ba rocket backstory for the purposes of this movie was all we needed. You know, who the, you know, who the high evolutionary's mother was or birth planet really doesn't matter here for me. I'm, I'm just, an, I, I really am as an actor in general, not just for this, I'm very wary of overly researching stuff because sometimes you get so lost in those details and they're what we then take into the room and sometimes they block what's actually in front of you or what's on the text and then statements like oh i don't think my character would do this start to pop up or i don't think you and you just go well why the hell not the script says you do it like find a way to navigate that does that make sense so I, I really didn't discuss that with James. In fact, I just found out that, you know, reading an interview he did that the high evolutionary visited Earth in the 80s. I just find that, I was like, oh, that's, that's really I interesting. That. I, it, wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been useful to me playing it at all because my line is just, I visited your planet years ago. That's, that's all I need. I've been there and seen it. So no, I, I didn't go into those sort of discussions. Believe me, there was so much on that page that I just couldn't wait to uh, flesh out as it was, you know? Yeah, I also I saw the the Instagram reel. I think you might have posted it today or been like a collaborator on the post or something. But you were talking about how as an actor on film and TV, you have to be a like you have to be the person, not the character. Mm. As opposed to theater, you you really do have to kind of character it up. I mean, mm -hmm. it, when, when it comes to a character like the High Evolutionary, which as you say is like the Shakespearean guy, which may do you feel like that he maybe kind of walked that line for you? Did, what how, what did you have to do differently with uh, with High Evolutionary as a performer to become the character? in terms of kind of what, what you posted this morning about it's Character. not yeah um yeah. well to just clarify for your audiences i was talking about how bob krakow said to me when taking his acting class that the minute you stop playing character and start playing a person you're going to book stuff and i think that those two things aren't mutually exclusive i've always said it's all about character i believe when you have a role you create the character now the character you create at home you don't want to get in front of the camera and start showing people a character somewhere between building that character at home and getting to the camera that character has to somehow become you so that people aren't seeing you play a character perform a character people are believing this character is you but it all starts with creating character and my problem with some of um some approaches to playing a role is if people can't relate to it if, if it's not a real person then they feel like I, I, I can't play that and for me I believe that you can play anything you know if you create a believable character and that you believe in it and once you believe in that character you've worked on at home and done your homework and studied with if you believe it you can be that person when the camera starts rolling you know I hope that sort of distinction makes sense and 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 that's how I felt about the high evolutionary. People aren't interested in real life. The, the mistake I feel a lot of actors make is that this has to be something real. No, it has to be something truthful. It has to be something you believe in. You have to believe in that character. And if you believe in it, people will believe in it and they will see the character as you, you know?
yeah, well, your work it comes through, man. And I know we have a lot of uh, a lot of young fans who also are very interested in, in acting as an art. They want to. Some of them want to get into it themselves. So I really appreciate you opening up about that, sharing that. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks for asking that question. It's kind of it was fun looking at that reel because Sag sent it to me. Too. I was like, oh my god, I look so young. <laughs> That's all I can think about. <laughs> My cheekbones were popping. I was like, well, oh, I look really good. So, <laughs> what happened? Yeah. Um. <laughs> Jamie, I think you oh, got this. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, so uh, this movie, it you know, it doesn't shy away from like the mature content. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, you know, this you, some harsh treatment of animals, uh, all that. Uh, you you know, you you play a, a mean man, <laughs> and I and I would say it's definitely one of the more mature movies uh, in the franchise, uh, it, which has gotten a big reaction mm -hmm. from the audience. Um, what? Uh, how has that been for you? This the fan reaction has that been a surprise for you? Yeah, it had. I mean, I was talking to James about it. We knew we had something on, it hadn't been done yet in Marvel, really, to go where we went with this. And there were moments where James was like, oh my God, I don't know. I don't know if they're going to let me. I don't. But James pretty much gets <laughs> what James wants because he understands, he understands the audience and he understands story. And the fact of the matter was, he's always said this was about Rocket you know, right from the start, Rocket's story. And from that first moment, we saw Rocket take off his shirt in the first one in prison with Peter Quill. And you saw the markings to that wonderful scene in the second one with Drax, where he says, I didn't ask to be made like this. There's something really dark in his past. And it would have been a real shame to shy away from the brutality of it in order to, I don't know, sugarcoat a PG-13 rating more give the truth of it and the brutality. And also it's a, the bigger picture. You saw James has won an award from Peter for you know being considered, it's all about cruelty. And the fact is that sometimes in life, even whilst having fun, we have to remind people why we're telling these stories. And we had to go to the nth degree with this. And I had to go to the nth degree with it. And James told me to ground it because we were going to go to the nth degree of it. And I'm so glad we did it. And it's wonderful. This I'm still surprised by the fan reaction. Even James said, you know, that with his reaction to people's reaction to the high evolutionary stuff, how much they love to hate him. He says, I've never seen anything like it. And I, I so you can only imagine if how if he's surprised, how much more surprised I am coming to it. So I'm just happy it's resonating and just happy I think people still can sort of separate me from him, you know, because he's a really nasty piece of work. That's why I had my dog, Cicero. Look, I have a dog, a guy, you know. <laughs> Self-preservation, I have a dog. <laughs> Um, so you talked a lot about everybody else's reaction, but I want to ask you about yours. So you mm. gave an interview recently, I think it was, was it Hollywood Reporter? But like about the first time that you actually spoke, like actually saw like the performance with everybody mm. else. And you were actually in a set with humans playing Lila, Rocket, Floor, and Teeps, right? Mm -hmm. So you get the weird like hilarity of the James Cameron vision ping pong ball suits and you're mm -hmm. acting against them. <laughs> but then you get to see like the actual animals on. And you said something very funny in that review where you like were, in that interview where you were like, the first time you saw it, you said, oh, I'm going to hell. This is bad. Yeah. This, is, this is very <laughs> bad. This is bad. Can you, can you talk to about more about when you first oh, saw man. it? Yeah, I finally saw it in New York. They arranged a special screening for me here in New York. With, and it was just myself, my manager, and um, my publicist. And I'm watching. So the movie starts. And in my head, I still think I know what's coming, right? I still think. And then the very first shot of Young Rocket, how watery his eyes, you know, and brown, his eyes were, and so human, his eyes were, you know, they, Stefan and the VFX team, I mean, they friggin' nailed the cuteness of that animal. And then knowing what I was going to do, especially that scene with Teeps and Floor and Rock, you know, and coming in and just going, oh my God, I'm gonna do this thing to them. And they were all so cute. And the, it was like watershed down, you know, like you really believed in these animals. They were so real. And then I, I knew what was coming and then I did it. And I genuinely just had the thought, <laughs> I'm going to hell. Like, this is such a horrible guy because I was shocked by it. And I came back and I was talking to my wife about it. And I just said, can, can I use the B word? Uh, the, can I swear in this? 
No, no sure. I'm so, I, I, I just said, I, I just said, she says, how was it? And I just went, I'm a bastard. I'm a real, <laughs> I'm a real piece of shit. <laughs> and I knew, you know, you, there's a difference between knowing it and then seeing it with these tangible creatures. And I, I really, really, I mean, I joked about Cicero as my shield, but I, I really thought about animals and I really thought about how completely helpless they are, you know, in many ways, you know. So, yeah, no, I my reaction was very, there was an emotion to it. I cried twice, you know, like in that movie. I won't tell you where it was because I don't want to <laughs> spoil it or, or, or get people to cry in the same place. But I cried twice, twice. So I cried twice when I first saw it, then I cried in the same two places when I saw it in the preview because it just, it just, it just broke my heart. And, you know, for the first time, I think I, I, this is the first interview I'm saying this, is like, as an actor, I've never been really fully, fully convinced about my work. <laughs> you know, I've been getting better at convincing, at being more and more convinced. But my reaction to watching some of those scenes and stuff, I found that I had allowed myself to just be an audience member and watch myself do this instead of the usual thing of, oh, I could have done that better and all that. And that happened several times in this movie. So I'm, I'm actually, without being satisfied, I'm deeply proud of, of the reaction I gave myself watching myself, you know? Yeah. Wow. That's awesome to hear. I'm happy for you. That's really cool. That's probably a pretty cool experience to reach that point. It's like, wow, that's, 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 I can see the character up there in this story. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you performed this character at San Diego Comic-Con, too. I was in Hall H. Uh, <laughs> were you? Month. You were there? Yeah, I was there. Oh. We, have, we have a video of it on our on our channel. Uh, it was awesome, man. You kind of you walked like 10 rows behind me. Uh, yeah. But I, I was wondering, we like... Did we interview afterwards? We yeah, interviewed at, afterwards, at Comic-Con, yeah. Yeah, but you were, you were actually in the hall for it also. Oh, I sprinted. When I say I ran, because Disney <laughs> says, Disney's like, all right, if you want to go to the panel, you can't also do the press line. And I'm like, hold my beer. Watch <laughs> out for the front. And I get to that, because we have Jim who... We, we let him out of his jet. We have a joke. You won't. <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while. Uh, and he got to the line and he did a couple of the Ant-Man interviews because they went first. And yeah. he was texting me like, hey, they're showing up. And I was like, all right, all right, all right. And I left the convention center and sprinted to that wow. hill. And, and I was like, okay. And I made it. And I was doing my first interview like. <sighs> it was worth it because I got to see some awesome stuff. But I, I mean, for you, that because. Other people from the Marvel universe, earlier that day, The Rock did Black Adam. He came mm. in as Black Adam. But we've seen Michael Rooker as Yondu, Tom Hiddleston as Loki, and Robert Downey Jr. kind of as Tony Stark, but also Robert Downey Jr. and Tony Stark. Like, where's the line? Who knows? Yeah. But, uh, but did, you, did you look at any of that? Did you talk to anybody? What was that experience like to go out there in front of, I think, like 6,000 people in your high evolutionary garb and, and perform that? The, I mean, more frightening than any opening night or performance I've had on stage because – you know, when you're, you're, you're playing a character, you, it's all about the character, right? You turn up as the character or you turn up as yourself or you turn up as a character. This middle ground where you're not really a character because it's unscripted, but you're not yourself either because you it was terrifying. And I only found out about it like a week, less than a week beforehand. You know, I get a call from Simon Hatt, one of the executive producers saying him and James were talking and James thinks it would, James thinks it would be a great idea if you turn up. <laughs> As the high evil in whole age, I was like, of course he does. And yeah, of course I'll do it. And then afterwards, I was like, holy shit. You know, um, it was terrifying. And I remember being backstage in full costume. And, but then the trailer, the first teaser came up backstage. And I was able to see it on the screen. And I just, the, there was a moment where I just went, oh, I'm part of this. And then I, they smuggled me into Hall H and the lights came on. And the audience went nuts. And I, you were there, and I started. See, I saw fathers with their sons and grandmothers with their kids, and the generational love and excitement. It felt like they were seeing the high evil, not Chikuri be the high evil. And I suddenly knew what it meant to everyone in that hall. And I suddenly knew what I was supposed to be doing there, you know, which was that was the leap from the comic. And I, it, the thought suddenly hit me, this is the first. They've seen the comic, and this is him here. Does that make sense? And yeah. then that's when, I don't know if you remember, in the whole age, there was a moment where I just went <laughs> like that. Because yeah. I was like, ah, oh, I get it. And then the rest, I could have done it all day. 
you know, because that's when it clicked. Dude, that's awesome. That yeah, was cool. Yeah. That was a cool moment. That was one of the most, <laughs> most terrible hall. I've been in Hall H every year for like, I think seven years now. The first wow. time I slept on the sidewalk, and since then I've been doing it for work. Wow. <laughs> Just wanted to get in there. Now I now I get to cut the line. I feel so spoiled. But that was one of the coolest moments in there. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. So kind of going back to your acting process, what was it like the experience of working alongside Sean Gunn as Rocket? Because obviously he's played the role for so long. What was it like to kind of form that dynamic and be Shakespearean against his version of Rocket? I mean, I, I, I attribute uh, my performance to working with Sean because there was a real act of it. I believe acting is actually reacting. When you've created your character and you trust it and you live it truthfully and stuff, what happens is you step into a room and there's someone in front of you and there's other eyes in front of you and there's a there's another voice in front of you and I could tactilely touch him even though they would then bring in the rocket thing to use for reference I could use Sean fully so I was acting with a very very powerful actor he's an excellent actor very emotive very available and so that meant I could I could act, <laughs> I could do what my job was, was there was someone there so that when he would move away and then there's a tennis ball or a, a figurine of, 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 of Rocket, I had Sean in my head, you know, I had that person there. So that was, that was, that made life. And James is an, was an actor himself. So he understood and understands the value of actually having someone there. There were a couple of moments. There was a great moment in that moment I was talking about where, where I'm, I'm at my worst, where I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna come in here. When I come in with a revolver, I don't wanna spoil it for people who haven't seen it, but you remember when I come and do the, the worst moment, I think, of my character. And we were trying to crack it. We'd done a few takes, we we're trying to crack it. And um, we were fine, we had a take, but you know when you know there's something else that could be there and james said okay come over they come see what they filmed yesterday sean and the group and stuff like that um in with motion capture you know just come see what they did come see what sean did and i was watching the monitor and then i heard sean do that ah! like cry and i was like i've got it and i go back and we do the scene again and before i do what I do. I did that sound. And James came rushing back and it was, okay, that's it. Do the sound. That's it. That's it. But do it three times. And that was the scene. And that was the brutality of the scene. And that's what I mean by having an actor there bring their own take to it and how it could inform what I then did, you know? Wow. Yeah. Process wow. stuff is so cool to hear about. It's so uh, it's so fun. <laughs> uh, well, one thing about this movie that's that's awesome is that you the movie broke a world record for most prosthetics. There's so yeah. many prosthetics in this film, and I think we could all agree that the that the craziest gnarliest is no offense your face. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, um, uh, what was that 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 reveal is wild. How much prosthetic was that? What was that like filming on set? It was. Well, first of all, you know, kudos to, you know, Alexi Dimitriev and to Cassie Rusek and Scotty and the whole team. And, you know, that just like made that process so quick. I mean, I was in and out of that chair in like 70, 75 minutes. They were that good. The first time I did it, my regular look took about two hours, but within a few days, you know, they had it down to 75 minutes and they kept r and in it, like trying to figure out how can we make it more comfortable? How can we make it so it doesn't shift so much? How can we make it easier for him to act and still have the effect? It was just a masterclass in trying to get everything perfect, you know? And the reveal you're talking about, that actually might've been even quicker because they'd been thinking about it and figured out that, you know, well, it's a mask underneath a mask, you know what I mean? And they, it was just about getting the texture right on the day, you know? So they had the mask ready and they, they, they you know, it took about 75, maybe 80 minutes to put it on. And then they, they put the other prosthetic over it, you know, so that it literally was very practical. What you see happen, happened, you know, wow. <laughs> and stuff. So they were just such a great team in, 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 I mean, that was the top level. I mean, I'm just not going to work with a better group of, of makeup artists than that, you know? Wow. That's yeah. That was, that was quite a gnarly look. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, that, and was that's... The, that was one of the moments where we just went PG 13. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is Mickey okay with it? Anybody call yeah. Mickey? Is yeah, he letting okay. this one fly? Are we good? Are we good? Okay. All right. <laughs> 
<laughs> this isn't the twilight zone. This is okay. We're doing this. Okay, fine. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, th th there's no way to skirt around these next couple questions. If anybody is watching or listening who has not seen Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three yet, these are definitely uh, some spoilery Spoilers. questions. So this is your pause. Come back after you uh, you go see my favorite movie of the year so far, uh, and then uh, come back and listen to the rest of this podcast. But uh, I mean, at the end of the movie, we see High Evolutionary presumably go down with you know his uh flying it's lab of, lab yes yeah yes. all of it because rocket chooses not to kill him but then yeah. presumably uh he goes down with the ship i mean were, was that always the ending did you guys discuss any other sort of outcomes for high evolutionary well the, the let me just put it this way you will be um, I, i'm hoping you see in an extended version and maybe an alternate ending <laughs> you know that we certainly did film you know i mean the whole point is that in marvel unless you see someone die they haven't necessarily died and even if they do die what does that mean in a multiverse right but the point is that uh rocket doesn't shoot me they make a point of saying why don't you kill him and he says no i'm not going to kill him and you don't actually see me uh go down with the ship so i'll just leave it at that <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. Uh, I was going to ask a follow up question, but I feel mm. like I already got it. So I'll ask one from the fans in the chat instead. I'm not going to do the very try tears, uh, ask a black actor about playing other black actors. We're not going to do that here. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> but would you come back to Marvel if asked for another role? Dude, I'd, 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 in a second, you know, come on. It's it, Marvel is, you know, I, I said, slightly flippantly once that I, I, I sort of hate it when very well-known respected actors talk about acting in Marvel and, and saying it's because the kids asked me to, it's for the kids, you know, and I called it out as bullshit. You know, it's, these are great characters. You know, these are, this is what pop culture, you know, big part of our culture and our, our it's very, 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 I mean, they are part of, if they'd had the technology, <laughs> We'd have been having Marvel movies of the, you know, much earlier because they're part of our whole culture and our, uh, how we've grown up. And this character in particular, I mean, to to have a character like this that calls upon all my Shakespearean experience of twenty years of acting, as well as being in this in this medium to work with a director as good, who writes characters well, as James Gunn, and then to do it on a platform where you were talking about Hall H, where millions and millions of people watch it and it means so much to them and we tell these stories about outsiders about you know think of the the x-men you know like civil rights movements and what mutants were represented when they created them all these symbols ultimately talking about how we can be better comic books and marvel and whatever very important part of our the zeitgeist and will be talked about millennia from now about this phase of bringing them forward so the answer short answer to your question is i would completely love to come back and play the high evolutionary more projects if i were wanted you know oh, fingers okay. crossed <laughs> <laughs> So kind of talking about your larger comic book work, um, I'm a huge DC fan. We spoke at the Peacemaker Junket. Uh, words on, word on the street is that James talked to a Guardians of the Galaxy cast member about possibly playing Lex Luthor. Can you say if that was you? And if not, um, obviously Mern had his conclusion in Peacemaker, but is there another DC character that you wouldn't be opposed to playing? Well, to your first question, I can, question, I can categorically say no, it wasn't me. You know, um, as far as Mern, who not only died once, but died twice. <laughs> so we can assume he's dead, you know, like um, DC characters. I mean, oh, God, there, um, there's so many, so many cool ones. I mean, if he, but there's so many, there have been too many Jokers, but I love the freaking Joker. I love the Joker. You know, there's variants of the Green Lantern that are really interesting. Do you know what I mean? You know, that that could come around that are really fun. Um, I can't believe I'm forgetting the name, but there's a sorcerer, Ego, oh, I can't believe I'm saying that. I, I mentioned this in an interview. He comes from the days of Merlin and he lives today right now. And he sort of has a demon inside him that comes out of it like incredible. Etrigan? Yes, yes. Etrigan. Yeah. In fact, I was talking to a friend about it. I was like, this character is also, this is Jekyll and Hyde in the DC world. So Etrigan, if you told me name one, it would be Etrigan. Like, I just love the idea of having two people existing in one, you know, that'd be, that'd be my, 
that'd be my DC one, Etrigan. Yeah. You mentioned. I that. love the fact you guys knew that. That's so. I thought that was super <laughs> obscure. You're like, oh, you mean that's okay? Oh, yeah, I have coffee. I have an action figure <laughs> of him, like over there. Yeah. Are you so. Can I see yeah. it? Can I? No. <laughs> get it. I, I'll, 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 I, I would have to get up, but I'll show you. To show, I'd but love yeah, to I just wanted. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I have to say uh, that that Mern dying twice is exactly what somebody named Clemson. Uh, should, as a South Carolina fan, I'm not saying anybody in the world named Clemson, but the, that, for twice. a fictional character, for a fictional character, I'm not mad. I thought, but I, I love Peacemaker. Peacemaker, I'm so sorry, Jamie. I know how precious uh, a certain Marvel show is to you, but Peacemaker is my favorite comic book show uh, since like 2020, since all the, the, the streaming mm -hmm. era began. I thought Peacemaker was incredible, and I think Guardians is probably my favorite comic book film since like Avengers Endgame. So you're, dude, Thank I'm you not so. saying you got the magic touch, but uh, quite a coincidence. <laughs> that I mean, both no, I feel, you know what, guys? I mean, I'm sitting here talking to you, and Brandon, I've sort of known, we've, we've been doing this for a while, and, and Jenna also for Peacemaker, right? So I sort of have known you for, and the sort of conversations we're having now compared to, that morning in Atlanta when it was Peacemaker and it was the first thing and this was something in the horizon and stuff. It's a crazy ride. And and the fact that it's a two for two for you and Brandon, you know, that's that just makes me really happy that I, uh, James, my career is split into two phases before James gone and after James gone. And I feel very <laughs> lucky about that, you know? <laughs> I love that, dude. Every time we've talked, you've always been a, a, just a delightful person to interact with. And I, I think you're so damn talented. It's fun to see you. Uh, I know you've been at this for a while. I've, in prepping for this interview, I looked at your career and I could just see how long you've been working so hard to do these sort of things. And it's awesome to see uh, to see you get your flowers here, for lack of a better phrase about it. That's why I'm not a writer. But uh, <laughs> awesome, dude. Uh, and I, I can't you. tell you how much I appreciate you coming on the show today. It's an absolute pleasure to get to talk with you. I know our audience really enjoyed listening uh, and watching. And I know everybody who's listening in podcast form over the weekend is just, just I'm sure they just had a great time with us. So uh, I really appreciate you coming on and talking with us. We could do this all day, but uh, I, I got to let you go. And uh, just hopefully somewhere down the road, you play high evolutionary again. You always got a spot here on phase zero. Uh, we'd love to talk again sometime, dude. Thank you so much. And uh, it's been a real pleasure talking to you guys. I hope we do it again soon. Thanks, man. Uh, okay. If you, you're free to close out the browser, it'll you will no longer be broadcast with us. Uh, you will, you know, you don't have to worry about that. But uh, so thank you when so I much. say, Whoa. Jesus, Brandon, son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you didn't close out? Uh, Dude, didn't we talk about this last time? Jesus. <laughs> All right, guys, take it easy. I, I, like, I, I think that's what happens every time I get off a of Zoom with somebody. Now I know. <laughs> <laughs> take care, guys. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today. Bye. Bye. What an, wow. what an incredible show, man. We are, we are, we are blessed with some awesome. epic guests. That's My crazy. goodness. Wow, that was awesome. I mean, that's that's today's show. I just didn't want to have him sit through our outro. Uh, <laughs> that was that was an. I mean, we could have gone all day with that. Was like he was so insightful. I loved hearing him talk about the process and the kind of. I love to hear more about those uh, those deleted scenes and stuff like that that didn't make it. I think there's some really interesting stuff there too. Uh, I, I, James, if you're listening, you're welcome, buddy. Come on, let's chop up the trilogy and what didn't make the cut. Come on now, uh, Jenna. Any last words for today's show? It's at Hey, it's Jenna Lynn on all social medias. Uh, go read some comics as always. Um, I know there's a lot of comics just this week about certain decisions being in upcoming comics, but there are so many good comics out there to read. So just go check them out. Try to have a good time and drown out the noise. So. Yes. Jamie. Well, that was awesome. Uh, I'm, that was so cool. Uh, yeah, follow me at, at Jamie Cinematics on uh, Twitter and Letterboxd. Um, and do me a favor, please watch Muppets Mayhem because the creator said that they want to create a Muppet verse, uh, and the only way that's going to happen is if you guys watch that show. Because uh, if I don't get my Muppet verse, I'm gonna be sad. You better get a cameo. You've been pushing the Muppet verse. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Aaron, what you got for us today? It's at some like Hornet on Twitter. Um, so I have to send this book to BD because you guys are doing Spider Verse trivia. Somebody will get this illustrated guide to the Spider Verse as a part of the contest. I'll make sure that it's a part of that. Uh, Polite Society is streaming now. And also, go buy your copy of Etrigan number one right now yeah. before the rush. Because <laughs> I want that. Yeah. I love it. I love it. All right, guys. I thought this was an awesome show. Thank you to all three of you for, for doing an awesome job with me today. I, I, had a, I had a lot of fun on this one. I'm really proud we were able to get Chuck Woody on the show. Uh, hopefully, we can get some more awesome guests lined up. I mean, 
Secret Invasion is not far off. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. If anybody else from that cast wants to join us or you want us to reach out to anybody, uh, we will do our best to just keep getting some cool people on the show. Uh, please, if you're not subscribed to the Phase Zero channel on YouTube, please do so. We've been posting videos, great interviews. Jenna, uh, Jamie, Liam all have great interviews up there from Guardians. we got Spider-Verse around the corner. we got this Spider-Verse trivia thing coming. So send an email to phasezero at comicbook.com and uh, make the subject uh, Spider-Verse event and tell us why you would be a great deserving fan to be a part of the Spider-Verse trivia where you can get some epic prizes and we'll make that happen. And that's today's show. We'll see you. Uh, we'll see you a week from today for another episode of Phase Zero. Uh, if you want to talk more, hit me up at Brandon Davis BD. But I think you hear from me enough. So, so that's that. All right, y'all. Thanks, Richard and Peter, for a great show backstage too. All right, guys, have a good week. <laughs>